Katie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on this webinar today. My name is Teresa, and I work at Taquamanon Falls State Park. Hopefully, you guys are all here uh, for the webinar today to learn about Taquamanon Falls and the ecosystems and the habitat that are found there. Uh, so to begin with today, I thought I would show you where I'm at um, compared to maybe where you guys are. So the park is located in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. So um, here you can see a, a Google Earth image of Michigan, hopefully. And um, up here is where I'm at in the green zone in the Eastern Upper Peninsula, about an hour and a half north of the Mackinac Bridge. Now the park itself is about 50,000 acres in size. Taquamanon is known for its waterfalls, but we actually have a lot more than just waterfalls at our park. So 50,000 acres is pretty big. Um, if you visited before the upper falls and the lower falls, they take up probably about 500 acres out of the 50,000. So um, let's see what 50,000 acres looks like in other parts of Michigan. If I put our park boundary over, say, Detroit, you can see it covers um, pretty much all of the inner part of Detroit. So Ford Field and Comerica Park are down here, heads all the way up, um, all the way up into Southfield and Redford Township. So 50,000 acres covers quite a bit of land. What if you're in the western part of the upper peninsula or the lower peninsula? Uh, 50,000 acres covers quite a bit in the Grand Rapids area. So all of downtown Grand Rapids, all of East Grand Rapids, and even down here towards the airport. So 50,000 acres is a pretty big section of land. And I'm going to talk about some of the different ecosystems and communities and species that are found within Taquamanon Falls State Park. If you wanna follow along today with something like this, you're totally welcome to. We're going to start by talking about the peatland ecosystem. Now peatland is characterized by peat and in our map of the park, Peatland is actually the northern section of the park. So all this area north of the main road that looks kind of brown and green, you can see a couple lakes in there. This is all the peatland of Taquamanon Falls. It's about 20,000 acres and it's protected as a natural area, which means that only foot traffic is allowed in there. You can hike, you can snowshoe, you can ski in there, but you cannot drive in here. The peatland ecosystem, as I mentioned, is characterized by peat um, or sphagnum moss. And if we zoom in close, um, one of the communities that are found in a peatland is a bog. Now, when I say the word bog, what comes to your mind? Do you get the image of terrible movies that feature bogs? Maybe you think of the preservative qualities of bogs. Oftentimes National Geographic images come to my mind of the bodies that are preserved inside bogs. Or maybe if you're from a different part of the world, like England, what comes to mind is the Bog Snorkeling Championship, which is something that really happens in England. Well, at Taquamanon, our bogs look a little something like this. So it's basically a low spot in the ground that has collected water over time, and it is highlighted by special plants that grow around this acidic environment. The first plant that we're going to talk about today is a plant called sphagnum moss or peat moss. Sphagnum moss is um, the primary species of the bog, and I have a little bit with me today. Um, it's a uh, it's a mossy kind of plant where the living part is nice and green. And over time, as it grows, it actually grows on top of the old moss, which eventually becomes peat. So the, the brown stuff, you can envision this plant growing very slowly over time and getting deeper and deeper and deeper. The stuff underneath doesn't decompose because bacteria does not live in the bog. So over time, this gets deeper and deeper. And if you were to walk out on a bog, this is the part that you would walk on. It's kind of wavy. One of the other things about peat or sphagnum moss is it absorbs a lot of water. So anytime it rains at Sequaminon, this peat 
soaks up a lot of the water. So we don't have a ton of flooding or these crazy rain events that you get in other parts of Michigan. It absorbs so much liquid that Native Americans used to put sphagnum moss in their babies' diapers to help absorb, you know, liquid. The other plants that are present in a bog besides sphagnum moss um, include cranberries. So if you were to come out to Tequamanon in September or October and walk through the bogs, you too could pick edible wild cranberries. So lots of cranberries grow out in the bogs. And last but not least, we have a plant called a pitcher plant. Now, pitcher plants are actually carnivorous plants, which means they eat meat, correct. So carnivorous plants are meat-eating plants. Now, when I think of carnivorous plants, the first thing that comes to my mind, again, to go with our terrible movie theme today, are these crazy, old, terrible horror movies. Bonus points. If in the chat, you know the name of this movie. Double bonus points if you know the name of the plant, the meat-eating plant in the movie. We'll come back to it. Sometimes when you think of carnivorous plants, you might think of Venus flytrap. That's often what people think of. I would call this more of an active carnivorous plant because it actively is trying to consume the plants. Whereas a pitcher plant, is more of an inactive, lazy kind of plant. Its leaf over time has been modified to be like a cup or a pitcher that collects rainwater or precipitation. You can see in this image the little hairs on the lip of the plant. The plant also gives off an odor that attracts flies and insects that crawl down into the plant and then drown inside the liquid. The plant then detects the movement of the bug in the liquid and releases digestive enzymes to basically digest it or dissolve it from the inside out. Now, I took a video of a pitcher plant at the bogs of Tequamanon Falls, and um, I dumped out the water and cut it open so we could see what it looks like inside. You can see the hairs slippery part of the plant where the insect gets swooped in and down Eel. at the base you can see those tiny little things floating around all the insects it's eaten some are still alive oh, wiggly worms so inside the pitcher plant Gross. after it's digested its meal, the exoskeleton of the insect is what's left over. So, you know, insects have their skeletons on the outside of their body. So after the plant has digested all the inside stuff, all the goodness, the exoskeletons kind of float to the bottom and get stuck in the stem. And in this particular um, video, you can see other animals are living inside the pitcher plant. So we have like these tiny little worms that apparently are not impacted by the dissolving juices of the plant that are actually living inside the plant, like its own ecosystem. Bogs are cool. Some other animals and plants that live inside the bog include the mink frog, which is similar to a green frog, but if you've ever caught frogs before, you know they're kind of slippery, so you hold on tight. The mink frog stinks when you hold on to it tight, so you can kind of tell it gives off a little bit of an odor. We have beavers and dragonflies that live in the bog, as well as some pretty unique plants such as Labrador tea. Now Labrador tea, um, as you can imagine, used to be used as a tea to actually treat headaches and aches and pains, sort of like an aspirin. So Native Americans would pick the leaves, dry them, and soak them in a hot water to see, like, just like we would with a tea. Now those leaves, contain something called tannic acid. So just like the tea bags we have, if I put this tea bag in some hot water, eventually this water is going to turn what color? Brown, right? So the tea, the, the plants, the dried up leaves are going to release not only their um, flavor and their scent, but also their color. And the same is true with the plants that live in the bogs of Tequamanon and in the peatlands. Once they touch water, they too start to release their odors 
um, and their tastes. And over time, it actually turns that water brown as well. So the second community we're going to talk about in the peatland today is the dune community. Now, when you think of a dune, when I think of a dune, I think of like big giant sand mountains and I think of camels and scorpions and stuff like that. But at Tequamanon, our dunes are not quite like that. We actually have ancient sand dunes that have been around for thousands of years, so long that they've started to grow plants and trees on them. So when you walk through the peatland of Tequamanon, you're going to walk on a high dune covered in plants and trees, and then you're going to walk down into like a bog, and then up into the dunes and down into the bog. And that's what our peatland kind of looks like. Now some of the animals that live inside this sand dune area include sandhill cranes, which you might have where you live as well. They feel so nice and safe here at the park that they actually have their young. We also have spruce grouse which is kind of like a wild chicken that lives at Tequamanon Falls. It's similar to a ruffed grouse, except this is more of a boreal species, which means that they like to live in northern parts of Canada, primarily. They have these crazy red eyebrows, which distinguishes them from our other native grouse. And birders from all over the country come to Tequamanon just to see this bird. So it's a pretty unique species that we have at Tequamanon. The last community within the peatland ecosystem is the lake community, which is more like an inland lake. Now this is a photo that I actually took from standing on top of a sand dune, one of those ancient sand dunes we just talked about, overlooking the lake and in the background is a bog. So it encompasses all three of those community types we talked about today. Now this lake is Clark Lake at Tequamanon and it is quite shallow. It's only about five feet deep, which means it is perfect for animals who like to eat fish. So ospreys can easily dive five feet underwater to get at fish. Bald eagles also prefer fish if they can. And of course, the biggest mammal in Michigan is the moose. Now, moose are known not only to be the largest mammals in Michigan, but for their ginormous antlers. So this is an antler from a moose that I have with me today. This time of year, the bull moose, the male moose, are carrying these giant things around on their head. Now this one weighs like eight pounds. I couldn't imagine having two of them on my head. They're made out of bone that of course um, grows throughout the summer. This time of year, they're as big as they're going to get. And why does a bull moose have antlers in the first place? Hmm. There's a couple reasons in particular. One is they use them to defend themselves against predators and also to fight for territory with other moose. But the second reason the moose grow these antlers is because ladies like them. So the ladies actually love big strong antlers and it shows that it's a fit male that would be a good dad. And so the ladies are looking for these moose antlers as well. Now come January or February, a moose similar to a deer actually sheds their antlers. So if you were to hike around the park that time of year, you might be lucky enough to find an antler. But you need to beat the animals to it. Ooh. Because animals like chipmunks and red squirrels and other rodents, they like to chew on the antlers to get the calcium and the nutrients out of them. So antlers actually don't last very long in the wild once they've been shed. You're pretty lucky if you ever get a chance to find one. So let's keep going with our presentation here. At this point, if you're following along, your worksheet should look something like this. So we've talked about the peatland ecosystem, some of the communities within, and some of the animals and species that are found there. Our second ecosystem we're going to talk about today is the forest ecosystem. Now forests, there's lots of different types of forests out there. Um, and in Michigan, in Tequamanon, we're gonna talk about three. The first one, is the old growth forest. So when I think of an old growth forest, I think of those big giant trees like out west that cars drive through. But in Michigan, we don't have those types of growing conditions and particularly not in the Eastern Upper Peninsula. So our main giant tree species include white pine and Eastern hemlock. This picture here with my dog by it is one of the largest white pines at Tequamanon Falls, one of the giant pines if you've ever hiked that loop. 
And that tree is probably about 150 years old. It would take about six people spreading their hands out in order to get around that tree. Now, um, this is an example of uh, Eastern hemlock, what I call a tree cookie or a slice of a tree. It is about the size of a water bottle, I would say. And from the time you were young, do you remember how to age a tree? Hmm, what do we do? So this Eastern hemlock is an example of um, an old growth species. But when it's little, it takes a long time to get big. So of course, to age a tree, we're actually going to count the rings of the tree. This one, if, I, if you had it in your hand and you were able to count it, is already 113 years old. So even though it's not very big, it's actually quite old. You can imagine then, once this tree does get big, our big hemlocks that we have at Tequamanon are anywhere from like 400 to 600 years old. And those make up the old growth forest at Tequamanon. Now, some of the species that live in the old growth forest include Michigan's, or actually North America's largest woodpecker, which is the pileated woodpecker, checking out the bugs and the different insects that live underneath the bark. There's a lot of shade in old growth forests. Not much sunlight gets in. So we have plants such as ferns and trillium, which is a wildflower that pops out in the spring. One of the largest mammals that lives in the old growth forest though is the bear. And in Michigan, what kind of bear do we have? Sometimes it seems like we should have polar bears, grizzly bears maybe, but in reality in Michigan, the only bear that's native is the black bear. So black bears actually live in the forests of Tequamanon Falls as well. And more on the ground, we have the red fox, which is also a species very common in the old growth. Our second community type within the forests of Tequamanon is the beech maple forest. Now, beech maples um, consist of the American beech tree and primarily sugar maple trees, which in Michigan we love because sugar maples give us maple syrup. That's right. So some of the species that live in the beech maple forest are include those that require maybe a little bit more sunlight, such as the pink lady slipper. The pink lady slipper is also known as the moccasin flower. You can envision it looking a bit like a slipper. We have salamanders that live in the beech maple forest underneath the rotten logs. If anyone out there likes to go foraging for wild mushrooms and wild edibles, chicken of the woods, commonly grows in the beech maple forest of Tequamanon. You can guess what it tastes like, I'm guessing. Probably just like chicken, yeah. Black bears also live in the beech maple forest of Tequamanon Falls, just like the old growth. Black bears actually live in all types of forests. And then we have owls that hang out in the beech maple forest. This one pictured as a barred owl, which from the time we're young, we are told that owls actually say, who cooks for you? Well, we're taught that owls say, hoo hoo, but this owl actually says, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? So we have different types of owls that live in the old growth forest as well. Uh oh, we froze, Katie. There we go. All right. So our last type of forest is um, that I'm going to talk about today is the Northern White Cedar Forest. Sometimes this is referred to as a cedar swamp, um, is often what we call it here in the Upper Peninsula. Now, when I say cedar swamp, again, going with our terrible movie theme, I often think of like Swamp Thing or some weird monsters that live in the, in the swamp. But in reality, the cedar swamps of Tequamanon Falls are highlighted by northern white cedar and again some of that peat moss on the bottom. So when you walk into a cedar swamp, you actually um, can feel in the summertime a couple degrees cooler in there. And when you talk, the, the forest like absorbs your sound. So there's no echo in, an, in a white cedar forest. So some of the animals that like to live in this wet kind of dense area include mosquitoes, unfortunately, but we have some birds that like to eat mosquitoes. 
such as warblers and our friend the chickadee. Now in the winter time, um, the cedar swamp is actually a bit warmer inside. So because of the dense forest, it collects a lot of the snow and um, keeps the wind out. So a cedar swamp can actually be a good spot for white-tailed deer to hang out in the winter time. The snow's not as deep and it's a bit warmer. In the UP, wherever we have white-tailed deer congregating, we're going to have their predators, the main predator being the gray wolf. So gray wolves will actually take out, um, primarily it's the old deer and the young deer, the ones that are easier to pick off out of the cedar swamp. So if you're following along on your worksheet, hopefully it looks a little something like this. We've talked about the forest and the three different communities that are found in the forest at Taquamanon, as well as some of the species, plants, and animals that are found there. Our last ecosystem we're going to talk about today is the river ecosystem. Now the river at Taquamanon Falls actually starts north of Newberry, and it starts in one of those peatland habitats, and eventually gains momentum and gains water, working its way over the upper falls, over the lower falls and it empties out into Whitefish Bay. You'll notice where it empties out, it's actually kind of brown in color, right? Hmm. Why in the world is the water brown right here? Hmm. Could it be the same reason this tea is turning brown? Yes. So it's the plant that cause the water to be brown. They release tannic acid into the water, turning it that brownish color. So tannic acid is present in lots of the trees within Tequamanon Falls, as well as many of the plants, such as sphagnum moss and Labrador tea. Now, eventually the Tequamanon River empties into the largest of the Great Lakes, the biggest, the deepest, the coldest, which is? Lake Superior, that's right. So Lake Superior is where the Tequamanon River empties eventually. Now within the river, um, we have a couple different animals that live in the slow moving parts of the river. So the first community is the slow moving community. This is a great spot if you're a duck because you can raise your ducklings without them having to be super strong swimmers yet. The ducks that I picture here are called common mergansers. Mergansers, um, the young actually hang out on mom's back, not only to hitch a ride, but also to stay safe from predators. One of the common predators of ducks in the Tequamanon River is the pike. The northern pike will eat just about anything that fits in its mouth, including ducklings. In the slower parts of the river, we also have mussels and clams that live there, as well as river otters, which eat a lot of the fish and little people that like to help me collect insects and bugs. The second part of the Tequamanon River we're gonna talk about today is the rapid or fast moving parts of the river. The fast moving part of the river is a little bit harder to live in because you either need to be a really strong swimmer or you need to be able to hang on tight. This is a video I took of a piece of sandstone. I took out of the river, I flipped it over and underneath, we have these little bugs that live there. These little bugs are called stone flies. They hang on tight and they use that fast water to move over their gills. These insects are an important part of the ecosystem in the river because they provide food for things like fish and ducks, but they also um, will then once they hatch and turn into adults, provide food for birds and other, um, other land life. So it's an important part of the ecosystem as well. The third part we're going to talk about today, last but not least of the river ecosystem is the waterfall. Now, if you've ever been to Tequamanon Falls, you have likely stood on that viewing platform and taken a selfie or a picture of the biggest waterfall in Michigan, which is the upper Tequamanon Falls. Now, the waterfall community is kind of unique because of what lives around it, but first let's take a picture, take a view of what the Tequamanon Upper Falls looks like right now. You can see why some people call it the Whiskey Falls or the Coca-Cola Falls. 
And again, that brown color is because of the tannic acid present in the plants and the trees, not the rock, not the mineral. The more water you have, the darker it looks. So when you see streaks in the waterfall, that's where there's more water coming over that sandstone ledge. Now the upper falls has sandstone surrounding it. Sandstone isn't the best substrate ever for a plant to grow. I can actually break the sandstone at the upper falls with my hands, so it's not super strong. But these plants have been able to latch on and they have plenty of water in order to thrive. So we have plants such as lichens, which look kind of like um, a little snake tongue or something hanging out. We have mosses and we also have grasses that live on the banks of the Tequamanon in the sandstone ledge. So hopefully if you've been following along, your sheet looks a little something like this. We've talked about different communities within the three ecosystems at Tequamanon, as well as some of the plants and animals that live there. The more filled out your sheet is, the more species you have, the more communities and ecosystems you have, the higher your biodiversity is which means if something bad happens, like a fire or a flood or some kind of natural disaster, your area would be more likely to survive and even thrive afterwards, the higher your biodiversity is. So at Tequamanon, we have pretty high biodiversity, which means if a natural disaster comes, odds are good Tequamanon would be able to survive. Now, people come from all over the country to see um, these birds to take selfies, to go on a hike, to hug an old growth tree. My question to you then is, who owns this park? Who owns the state parks in Michigan? The waterfalls, the birds, the plants, the animals, all of that is owned by the citizens of Michigan. So if you live in Michigan like I do, we are all partial owners of these beautiful parks that we're able to call our state parks. My job in working for the DNR is to make sure that our park stays safe and healthy so that you can come and enjoy it 365 days a year. So thank you for owning our park and taking a part in uh, public land ownership in Michigan. So with that, that concludes my webinar today. Thank you all for joining me um, on our special adventure. And I'd be happy to take any questions that might have come up, Katie. Sure thing. Can you guys hear me? Um, Teresa has disappeared from my screen. Awesome. Okay, there are a couple of questions here. Um, how often have you seen a moose in the park? Ooh, a moose, yes. Well, I wish I could say more. I have seen a moose probably about five or six times in my life. And it's usually there's one road that goes through the park and drives through that peatland habitat. And that's where I've seen them is usually feeding on the side of the road. It is pure chance if you're ever going to happen across a moose at Tuquamanon. Um, there's probably about 400 moose in the entire upper peninsula. So just luck if you get to see one. And um, someone also asked, have you ever seen a wolf at Tuquamanon Falls? Yeah, I have seen a wolf at Tuquamanon actually. Um, Again, fortunately, it's been while I've been in a car. It hasn't been while hiking, although I'm sure that there have been wolves out and about while I've been out and about. But luckily for us, wolves have a pretty healthy fear of people. Black bears do as well. So we don't encounter too many of those animals while we're out in the field. Um, the ones I have seen from my car have often been like going across the road. And I often get asked the difference between like a wolf and a coyote. And from my experience, when I see them cross the road, a coyote kind of looks at you and is a little scared and like bolts it across the road. Um, a wolf kind of stands there, looks at you, and then walks across the road. So they just seem to have an air of like importance about them compared to a coyote. Um, and then one more, um, what type of fish have you caught in the Tequamanon River? Oh, the Tequamanon River is my nemesis when it comes to fishing. Um, I don't do as well as others. It's kind of a tough river to fish just because um, back in the logging days, it was used as to transport logs out. And there is a lot, a lot of sunken logs down there. It has claimed a lot of my fishing lures. Um, but the few fish I have caught um, are usually walleye. I've been fortunate enough to catch a couple walleye out of there, perch um, and smallmouth bass. But Tequamanon is also known for as a musky fishery. 
So a lot of people will go musky fishing um, in the Tequamanon River as well. I personally have not caught one yet. Let me see if there's any, um, somebody did ask earlier and I answered a little bit. Um, they were asking about invasive species that um, end up in the bog. So down here it was Phragmites. I'm not sure what happens way up by you. We've been pretty fortunate so far um, to not have invasive species in our bogs yet. And um, it might be due to the fact that they're so remote and hard to get to. So it's basically just by foot that you can get to it, which slows the spread of invasive species. So. Luckily, we haven't found much up in the peatlands of Tequamanon yet. Good question, though. I also noticed that someone answered my movies correctly. So that crazy meat-eating plant is from Little Shop of Horrors. And it is Audrey, the second. Very nice, Phyllis. Um, I think that concludes our question session for today. I'm going to um, put a slide up here. So um, thank you, Teresa, for all of that great information. And um, if Anybody else has any questions, I'll leave this open for a little bit, but um, that's our program for today. So thank you all for coming and I hope you um, sign up for other webinars in the series or check out the website michigan.gov slash nature at home or um, join us at Facebook at My Nature DNR. Um, thanks again.